good morning sorry for the delay my myself dr sindhu i'm a pediatric intensivist at astra rv today's topic we, uh, what i am discussing is basically the newer guidelines which is being proposed by surviving sepsis uh, campaign which is an international guidelines for the management of sepsis and the septic shock now in this uh, camp, uh, recommendations there are almost 98 recommendations that have been proposed out of which i will be talking only about a few a few of them which are clinically uh, relevant to us and uh, these are basically recommendations and uh, the there are few strong recommendations there are few newly added when compared to the previous 2016 one and uh, most of them are very uh, weak recommendations so let's go ahead and we all know that you know sepsis and the septic shock has been a major health problem uh, in the world they account even for the mortality of almost 1 to 1.6 uh, uh, cases that we see for in every three cases right i will do it i will do it as not it so coming to the recommendations uh, so early recognition and is the key in sepsis management and management because all the studies have shown the early uh, intervention has improved the uh, mortality so going for the recommendations the first slide the first recommendations work in the uh, screening and, and early treatment of uh, sepsis i think the first recommendation that has been proposed is performance improvement program it uh, the committee recommends the performance improvement program for the sepsis including the sepsis screening for critically uh, acutely ill and high risk patients and standard sops this, this is a very straight forward uh, uh, statement that has been uh, given and even the studies have also shown that you know having a sepsis program improvement program like uh, sepsis screening med, uh, education or the measurement of sepsis bundle performance of patient uh, uh, outcomes all these have been improved outcomes when com when you compare to the uh, not having this so the committee has a very strong recommendations for this now the, the second recommendation that has been added and this is new in this guidelines that is the committee re uh, recommends against the use of qsofa now why this qsofa see if you see the last two guidelines that has been come from uh, surviving sepsis guidelines they have lot of emphasis was given on the qsofa because qsofa is the, the key for the early recognition and you know the mortality uh, mortality improvement but in this recommendations they have come against against the qsofa now qsofa basically it tells about the mortality the death the uh, in sepsis what uh, they during in the studies what have they found out is the q so far the specificity and uh, uh, sensitivity of this is very less and any two of this being positive also is coming under the uh, you know uh, um, it, it comes under the mortality range so overall the studies have shown when compared to q so far as well as the sirs news or news the q so far has not uh, lesser uh, prevalences when compared to the other uh, other uh, screening tools so the committee has strongly uh, recommended that against qsofa then for uh, these guidelines actually basically are adult guidelines because we all know once of usually they come up initially with the adult guidelines and then subsequently in one or two years with lot much changes but little bit of changes we come with the pediatric guidelines so most of them are relevant to pediatric also and these have been if you see all the recommendations one by one this basically it's the same thing what we have been doing in our clinical practice so the third recommendation what they say is uh, for adults suspected ha ha of having sepsis they suggest uh, suggest measuring lactate uh, levels now lactate levels and the what in this uh, major, majority of the studies they have taken the lactate uh, levels of 1.6 to 2.2 what they are saying is in a uh, why this has become uh, we all know lactate measuring a lactate is a good uh, good outcome because we do it in a day to day uh, uh, activity when it comes to sepsis why it has become a weak recommendation is because the lactate is is a cost it involves a cost and in especially in the developing countries this may not be relevant uh, they, it may not be feasible for them that's the main reason why they have put this into the uh, weaker recommendations next coming to the initial resuscitation now sepsis and the septic management are the medical emergency and uh, recommended the treatment and early 
immediate resuscitation should begin i think this is a best trade uh, it's a best uh, practice statement as well as it is a what we do and i don't think there's much need of you know discussion on this part the next recommendation what we have to see is for the septic patient with the hypoperfusion or in shock they have suggested 30 ml per kg of iv fluids especially the crystallites to be given in the first 3 hours of resuscitation now uh why they have taken this 30 ml per kg is because if you see the studies like you know the process study or the rice study or all these things they, in all those studies they have taken 30 ml per kg as a uh, their fluid challenge uh, patients so that's why this 30 ml has come come into picture and what they are saying is if like if you take more than 30 ml per kg the fluid overloaded uh, also it becomes an issue and the outcome when compared to the the lesser uh, uh, like less than 30 ml they have seen that you know the uh, rate response of going into uh, prolonged ventilation the hospital stay all of them have been increased so they have taken this 30 ml per kg as their uh, uh, point and the sixth recommendation is on the uh, uh, again this is again newer one that they have added for adults with septic sepsis and the septic shock they are using uh, they recommend using dynamic uh, measures to guide the fluid resuscitation over the physical examination or the static parameters now static parameters are your bp the crt or you know the uh, the uh, heart rate these are the static uh, measurements the dynamic measures are measuring your uh, the uh, systolic pressure uh, pressure variance, uh, variance systolic volume variance or you know then uh, the pulse pressure variance all these things the studies have shown in those patients who who in whom the uh, fluid uh, resuscitation guided by this dynamic measure measures have a better outcome when compared to the either the physical or the just a static parameters that's why the study again promotes the use of uh, dynamic measures the third uh, recommendation uh, the other recommendation is uh, guiding in sepsis and the septic shock they suggest guiding the resuscitation to decrease the serum lactate levels with uh, in patients with elevated lactate levels over not using lactate alone now we all know lactate a uh, higher lactate comes whenever there is a hypoperfusion so in even in the sepsis guidelines if you see previous guidelines the early goal directed management was one of the criteria is to reduce the lactate level now same thing was good here also in this recommendations also they say are saying you uh, reduce the lactate levels however you don't target towards the normalization of the lactate it is just uh, decreasing the lactate level is a good indicator in all the studies the another recommendation in uh, fluid resuscitation that has been added this time is the crt using the crt uh, to guide the resuscitation as an adjuvant to other uh, measures of perfusion now especially uh, this recommendation has come uh, uh, after the this some um, study called as a andromeda shock uh, study where they have st- seen those patients with the crt crt versus the lactate clearance for every 2 hours they have done and over the 8 hours what they have seen is those with the crt uh, based uh, uh, treatment the end a uh, product of you know the survival the organ uh, dysfunction everything was better when compared to the lactate so that's why they have taken this in this into the uh, present guidelines however the overall if you see there are no much clear cut uh, uh, evidence so they have still put it uh, under the weak recommendations and what they are saying why crt because it's a cost effective one there is no uh, money involved with it it is a uh, clinical g- clinical thing and which can be included and that's why it has come into the uh, recommendation pictures then the me, uh, another uh, recommendation that has come in the mean arterial pressure is they recommend for the initial targeting the map to 65 over the higher maps especially for the patients who are on vasopressors now uh, uh, there are enough studies like uh, targeting what uh, targeting a map especially a uh, good Uh, RCT had come with us uh, where they have uh, uh, studied between two series of map. That is one map of between 60 to 65. The other one was around 80 to 85 along with the vasopressors. 
what they have seen is that not much difference comes between at the end of the overall survival. However, those with the higher MAP uh, needed uh, less of uh, renal replacement therapies. And uh, however, one drawback was those with the higher uh, MAP uh, attained, especially using the higher inotrope, they were more uh, uh, you know, for, for uh, atrial fibrillation and uh, 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 the adverse effects of uh, the inotropes were more in this patient. But uh, there are another two RCTs were there who, which recommend that, you know, the uh, MAP targeted of 65 is more than enough because there are no uh, advantage of higher MAP over the lower MAP. That's why this has come as a strong recommendation in this particular uh, guidelines. Admitting to intensive care, I think this is uh, a clear cut. They suggest that the patients to be admitted to the ICU within six hours and that has shown to the improve the uh, overall uh, outcome of the patients. Coming to infections, in infections like I will go to this, uh, I think this, uh, this thing is very clear. First, in um, among the uh, infections, the first thing what they are saying is first, whenever possible, try to find the alternative diagnosis you know apart from sepsis look into the alter, alternate uh, guidelines and the second thing what they are saying is whenever there is a shock or there is a like whenever there is a shock or you know it is a definitely there is a sepsis then administer antibiotic within one hour of recognition suppose there is uh, no shock and the possibility of ha having a sepsis is low then you can still wait, uh, do the uh, uh, you know, necessary investigations, come to conclusion within three hours. Now, this three hours is very important because the studies have shown a delay in giving an antimicrobial between even three to five hours have shown to the worsening of the outcome. So whenever they were possible, uh, especially if there is a definite or definitive of sepsis, and the shock is present there is no sh there should not be any delay immediately give uh, antibiotic whenever even in this whenever there's possible sepsis just give antibiotics within one hour when the shock is absent you still can wait but the waiting period is less than three hours don't delay an antimicrobial within uh, beyond three hours and always look in you know whenever you have any non-infective or uh, you're suspecting any non-infective thing you, uh, you know come down on on the antibiotics because the major problem with the antibiotics was is the antibiotic resistance so in order to overcome this they have come up with this recommendations the same thing is in this uh, one is re-evaluating timing of antibiotic as i have told you immediately or within one hour whenever there is a sepsis then always rapidly assess for the non-infectious causes and uh, within three hours and uh, same thing, closely monitoring for the patients. So these things have been explained in this particular pro, uh, this thing. Then using biomarkers to start antibiotics. Now, what they're saying is they're strongly against using procalcitonin plus uh, clinical evaluation to decide when to start an antibiotic. So they're saying the studies, even though the procalcitonin is known to increase in all the, is a pre uh, pro-inflammatory and known to increase in the bacterial uh, infections, but to decide when to start an antibiotic based on just a pro procalcitonin or a, uh, with the clinical evaluation as compared to clinical evaluation alone is not suggested. The clinical, uh, they're not good, uh, even the uh, studies have shown there is not much difference between procalcitonin and Along with that, being a procalcitonin being expensive, they have still kept it under weaker recommendations. Coming to antimicrobial choice, especially the, what they're saying is whenever you're suspecting a high risk for MRSA, especially those patients who are on indwelling catheters or who have previous history of you know hospitalization with the chronic wounds, where you know there is a strongly there is a, a suspicious of uh, MRSA. Then, yeah. then use of antimicrobial, empirical antimicrobial for MRSA coverage has to be given. This is a best practice statement, not a recommendation. However, in a low risk of MRSA, they, start, uh, they uh, suggest against the use of empirical antibiotic with MRSA cover 
Same thing when comes to MDR. What they are saying is whenever there is a high risk for MDR organism, they suggest antimicrobial with gram negative cover for empirical treatment over the one antibiotic. However, if there is a risk is low, then there is no risk. Then again, committee uh, suggests against the use of two, two gram negative when compared to the one gram negative. And uh, whenever, uh, you know, once the, you have got the definitive organism growth, then com again, committee comes against use of against the double antibiotic over the uh, single antibiotic when the causative organism is known. So this is also very clear cut. Coming to antifungal therapy, uh, in uh, especially in high risk patients, as like uh, who are known for prone for uh, candidal infections or high risk of uh, fungal infection, especially these BMT patients or you know who are on uh, chemotherapy, already are line infected patients. In these cases, empirical antifungal therapy over no antifungal therapy. So the, the committee recommends uh, antifungal therapy. However, why it is a weak recommendation? Even though it is the best treatment policy that we all follow, why there is a weak recommendation? Because the fungal, uh, the not, not much studies have proven uh, benefit over uh, empirical starting uh, antifungal over non-starting the antifungal. Still, the studies have yet to come, so they have put it under the weak recommendations. Now, same thing uh, for low risk. This again, committee says this against the use of empirical antifungals. For antiviral therapy, there is no recommendations on any antiviral because uh, most of the viruses are. Uh, self-limiting and there is no directly treatment However, for COVID-19, they have a great guidance. It's not included in it. For the delivery of antibiotics, now, the delivery of antibiotics, now, again, this uh, uh, you know, uh, the stage that prolonged infusion of beta lactams of form maintenance over the conventional bolus therapy. Now, uh, this is mainly an adult gui uh, guidance as we know in pediatrics we have been using prolonged infusions only but in adults also they have come up with this uh, study saying that prolonged infusion of beta lactams are known to be beneficial over the conventional bolus infusions. Uh, in post control, again, committee recommends early identification or excluding a specific anatomical diagnosis of infection that requires emergent source control and implementing the required source control intervention as soon as medically and logistically it is practical. So again, this is the best practice statement. The studies have shown whenever they have done uh, immediate uh, source control, that is within six hours after the identification and logistically whenever it is possible, the overall outcome of the patients have been improved. So that's why the committee again recommends this as the best practice statement. Coming to the re removal of uh, uh, intravascular therapy, again, the committee recommends removal of intravascular devices that are a possible source of sepsis or the septic shock after other vascular access has been established. Now, this is also again a best state, practice statement. However, the, pro, the point comes, especially when there are uh, 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 intravascular access, which are like the tunnel work or the chemo ports. In those cases, when they are not in shock, the, pro, the point to be noted is when such patient without shock, then the committee says that you can go on with a prolonged antibiotic therapy in those cases. However, if you are suspecting a fungemia or the patient is in septic shock, even with the indwelling like chemocodes or the tunnel, the CVPs, they have to be removed. Otherwise, you just can continue with the antimicrobial therapy. However, the recommendations for these are very uh, feeble. Then coming to de-escalation, this is again, a, uh, this is what we also do, the best practice statement only. Every day, you have to assess for the de-escalation of the antibiotics over the fixed duration without any de uh, daily assessment of de-escalation. This is quite a straightforward. Coming to duration of antibiotics, the committee recommends a shorter over the longer duration of antimicrobial therapy. Like you can see in this uh, uh, particular chart, there are so many studies that have been done between the shorter and the longer durations. 
the especially eight days and uh, longer duration of 15 days however the outcome of these two there was no much difference that's why it has come into the uh, recommendation that shorter over the longer duration coming to discontinuation also what they are saying is instead of going for a fixed uh, fixed duration days or days of therapy whenever possible and whenever you know that you know adequate source control where the optimal duration of the therapy is unclear especially like when we see our case of anaga where we didn't know when exactly to stop in those uh, cases like you know the committee recommends using procalcitonin and clinical evaluation to decide when to discontinue antimicrobial over the clinical evaluation alone so these were under the infection part coming to the under the hemodynamic management the fluid management under fluids again it is been the previous uh, when compared these are the same thing they recommend crystalloids as the first line of uh, resuscitation fluid there are strong recommendation of this then coming to the crystalloids which crystalloid that is a balanced crystalloid instead of normal saline again the recommendations especially all this process arise all the studies have favored for the balanced uh, uh, more than favored the there was no uh, proper uh, difference between uh, no proper you know uh, whether uh, uh, not to say that balanced crystallizes uh, more than that and then uh, then there's another one study that has come uh, recently i think it's from, uh, i'm not sure about the trial in that what they're saying is is balanced crystalloid when compared to the ns the overall uh, uh, overall you know the outcome of the patient was better the hyperchloridemic uh, acidosis was also uh, not there the going for the crrt was lesser when compared to the uh, ns group that's why the committee recommends balanced crystalloids as a fluid resuscitation as choice so once the patient has received the flu uh, fluids next after the adequate fluids the uh, adequate fluids committee suggests using albumin in patients who have received larger volumes of crystalloids uh, crystalloids over using the crystalloids alone now this is come from the albino study the albino studies against shows not much difference between albumin as well as the uh, you know larger volume of uh, albumin versus ns during the initial resuscitation However, using an albumin after the initial resuscitation, whenever the fluid boluses are required, albumin alone has known to show the overall outcome of the patient. So, uh, albumin is still not in the initial resuscitation. However, it is in the subsequent resuscitation, albumin is still clear in the picture. Whereas, in the start, after the gelatin, still the committee has strong recommendations for not using them. Uh, for resuscitation mainly for anaphylaxis because these are known to cause anaphylaxis the renal uh, failure and uh, uh, hypovolemia again uh, more with these things that what the studies have shown so they are uh, you know use uh, recommend against use of starch and gelatin next which uh, after the fluids next thing is which uh, vasoactive agent that has to be used so start, uh, again the studies have shown norepinephrine as the first line of treatment for as a vasopressin over dopamine vasopressin or epinephrine whatever it is so the first line of uh, vasoactive agent is norepinephrine after the norepinephrine they are suggesting the use of vasopressin instead of escalating the dose of norepinephrine what they are saying is when the uh, norepinephrine le levels of using a, uh, in the range of 0.25 to 0.5 microgram per kg per minute add vasopressin because the these are the patients they are known to have vasopressin depletion no depletion uh, and instead of using the same uh, inotrope which is going to act the alpha interferon you use an another uh, uh, no, no, inotrope which is acting through another mechanism to increase the beat that's why the committee has come with the recommendation for vasopressin over epinephrine in as a second line of choice and once you have used both epinephrine as well as vasopressin the next and uh, vasopressor uh, vasopressor to be used what they are saying is epinephrine again for all these things especially the vasopressin as well as uh, uh, 
uh, epinephrine, the recommendations are still weak because not much study, uh, you know, the uh, pros and cons are still in, uh, under study. So that's why they have still put it as a weaker recommendation. And uh, coming to uh, using terlipresine or, you know, AC uh, angiotensin inhibitors too or terlipresine, all these are against uh, using, uh, uh, you know, vas uh, against, uh, 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 committee recommends against the use of terlipresine. Now, as why? Because one, mesenteric ischemia are known to be more with early present and uh, early present. And the, the, the digital gangrene again are known to be more with early present. That's why they are against the use of early present. So again, when using uh, vasopressin plus norepinephrine, what their studies have shown is, even though at a higher dose, these two also known to cause more of anemia and the... Uh, hmm, uh, you know, uh, more of arrhythmia uh, and uh, uh, digital is more when compared to vasopressin as well as norepinephrine versus vasopressin uh, as norepinephrine alone. So that's why this is still under the weaker recommendation. The vasoactive management is first use of norepinephrine as a first line of treatment. So target the map of 65. These were strong recommendations. One, the other one is continue with the invasive uh, BP monitoring. Then the initial uh, pressure that can be given. Then consider adding once uh, norepinephrine reaches 0.25 to 0.5, add pressure and consider using dobutamine as a treatment. So I know that especially in cardiac dysfunction as well as cardiac dysfunction where there is persistent hypoperfusion, despite the adequate volume, the we, the committee recommends using dobutamine to norepinephrine or using epinephrine alone. So again, studies have shown the better outcome with uh, dobutamine and to norepinephrine uh, with epinephrine, but still it is still a, a weak uh, recommendation. And uh, next, committee uh, uh, against the use of uh, levosimendal, especially in cardiac uh, uh, cardiac dysfunction with persistent hypoperfusion despite adequate volume uh, status and uh, MAP. This uh, committee rec uh, recommend because not much studies are in favor of levosimendal still. So, there still it is under the uh, weaker recommendation. Coming to uh, monitoring and intravenous ass uh, assessing. Again, the committee says that invasive monitoring is better and is uh, as soon as practically it is available. And they uh, suggest adding a vasopressor from a peripheral, ray, uh, peripheral line to restore map. However, what they are saying is uh, whenever using a peripheral line, use it with a, from a, for a shorter duration that is less than some two hours and using a good peripheral vein in the proximal to the anticubital fossa. So, these have been added into the recommendations. Fluid balance. Uh, the committee re uh, recommendation, there is an insufficient evidence uh, regarding the recommendation of use of restrictive versus the liberal fluids in the first 24 hours of resuscitation. Uh, not much studies have come up with, you know, whether, uh, to, with exact guidelines whether, whether to go for a restrictive or liberal. However, there are studies that have shown that with liberal fluid status, the overall outcome of the patients have, you know, uh, are not much, especially go, uh, those with the prolonged uh, ventilation and uh, needing the renal uh, uh, renal replacement therapies were more with the liberal fluid uh, strategies. However, there's not much uh, uh, data is still uh, applicable on that, and still studies are coming. In either one or two years, the studies will come up regarding the restrictive versus liberal fluids also. Coming to ventilation strategies, now these have been the same, uh, like uh, the committee recommends over the use of conservative oxygen target in adults with sepsis uh, induced hypoxemic uh, respiratory failure. So oxygen target is, you have to, uh, they are suggesting a saturation of 88 to 92 percent and PaO2 of 55 to 70 uh, mm of uh, 70. So that's the uh, recommendations what they are giving. And they are saying that uh, when compared to uh, NIV, the HFNC have shown to have better outcomes, especially in uh, sepsis. 
However, not much studies are there, but many of the studies are in favor of uh, HFNC over the NIV. Again, in uh, non-invasive and uh, over the invasive, it is a use of non-invasive has better outcomes uh, when compared to the invasive ventilations. And ARDS protocols, again, these have been the same. That is low tidal volume is better than uh, recommended. Uh, P plateau, uh, upper limit of P plateau of 30 centimeters of water over the higher P plus, then uh, higher P over the lower P. So these are all as per the ARDS protocol only, same recommendations have come in. Uh, again, low to tidal volume as compared to high tidal volume. Recruitment, they suggest uh, using traditional recruitment maneuver and uh, uh, they recommend against the use of incremental P uh, over the traditional recruitment maneuvers. Prone ventilation, what they're saying is once the uh, patient is intubated, immediately prone him uh, for more than 12 hours have shown to have better outcomes when less than 36 hours for more than uh, 12 hours each day have known to have better outcomes in ARDS uh, with severe hypoxemia. Uh, with coming to neuromuscular blockade, the recommendation is same as the previous one, that the intermittent uh, boluses are better than over the continuous infusion. Coming to ECMO, same thing, the VV ECMO, whenever possible, shift the patient to the, uh, the, the place where the VV ECMOs are available. Uh, corticosteroids, again, uh, the recommendations are same. That is, whenever the inotrope requirement is uh, more than 0.25, Go for, uh, 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 no, like uh, hydrocortisone. Again, it is the same hydrocortisone only they have taken. In adult, it is 200 mg per day. And uh, for as a continuous or the uh, infu or as a, uh, either as a interv uh, intermittent boluses over six hour, uh, every six hours or as a continuous infusion. So the committee, again, recommends the use of uh, corticosteroids. However, this is a weak recommendation because not much studies have come up uh, regarding the benefits of uh, uh, corticosteroids over not giving them. Coming to blood purifications like, you know, uh, plasma pheresis in or uh, polymix in B hemoperfusions, again, again, the committee recommends against the use of all these things as an adjuvant therapy for uh, a severe sepsis. Again, the recommendations are weak. And uh, the transmission targets, again, restrictive. It is same as compared to the, the transmission guidelines that have been there. The restrictive means uh, less than seven grams only. They're saying you, uh, you know, give the PRVC transmissions. Otherwise, you can still wait over. Then immunoglobulins, again, against the use of uh, IVIGs in sepsis. Stress ulcer prophylaxis suggests uh, using the stress ulcer. Uh, they, whenever there is a high risk for uh, GI bleed, the committee recommends the use of stress ulcer prophylaxis. Uh, coming to uh, venous thromboembolic pro uh, prophylaxis, committee says that whenever possible, whenever you're suspecting uh, uh, you know, venous thromboembolism, rec uh, recommends for the use of pharmacological therapy. And uh, under the pharmacological therapy, it recommends low molecular heparin versus the unfractioned heparin. Again, all the recommendations are very strong in this uh, for these two recommendations. And uh, whenever using, uh, always the pharmacological prophylaxis is better when compared to mecha mechanical uh, prophylaxis. So committee again recommends for the pharmacological pro uh, prophylaxis only. Renal replacement therapy. So whenever there is a need for renal replacement, committee suggests uh, you, you using either continuous or intermittent renal replacement therapy. However, whenever the patient is not uh, uh, needing renal replacement therapy, there is no need to use. That is a committee uh, uh, suggests against the use of renal replacement therapy when there is no definitive indications. Coming to glucose control, again, start the committee recommends the starting the insulin therapy when the glucose levels are more than 180 to 1 mg per dl. The committee recommends to maintain the sugars uh, between 144 to 180 because again, uh, if you are strict over the glucose control, especially when they are less than 144, they have seen more uh, incidence of hypoglycemia. So the, uh, the range they have given as 144 to 180. 
uh, again vitamin C in sepsis there is no evidences for a vitamin IV vitamin C bicarbonate therapy whenever uh, septic shock and hypoperfusion induced lactic acidosis then committee uh, suggests not, not to use uh, bicarbonate therapy to improve the hemodynamics or to reduce the vasopressor requirement however in severe metabolic acidosis that is in ph of 7.2 or the akin score that is renal uh, acute kidney injury then the committee says uh, you can uh, use the soda bicarbonate however the evidence again not up to the mark and uh, nutrition wise early nutrition again the recommendations are same as uh, compared to the previous one early enteral nutrition uh, recommendations are there that is within 72 hours of admission so these are the few guidelines that the recommendations have touched upon the rest are all based on the the outcomes the follow up again all the recommendations are weak only and they all are they are saying that uh, the you know uh, have a proper uh, follow up and uh, within like 72 hours uh, ask them to come back once and then the prolonged um, uh, follow ups are also required for all the patients who have been discharged from the hospital so thank you I don't know whether they understood or not.